pleasure to see everyone here today for the special service of the ordination and dedication of men committed to God and the service of deaconhood. We will read scriptures from both the Old and New Testaments. From the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 18, verses 13 through 23, from the New International Version reads as follows. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning till evening. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, what is this you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? Moses answered him, because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and laws. Moses' father-in-law replied, what you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me and I will give you some advice and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them the decrees and laws and show them the way to live and the duties they are to perform. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. From Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing and fulfillment this day of his holy word. At this time, the Reverend Booker, T Reverend DePriest Deering will lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, Thou who art the way, the truth, and the light. We are thankful for this occasion and the blessings of this day. We pray, gracious Heavenly Father, that this service will be to the glory and honor of your name. We pray, gracious Heavenly Father, for these deacons, that you would create in them clean hearts and renew a right spirit within. We pray, gracious Heavenly Father, for the message that the pastor will give. Help us to continue to work together with love and rejoice and, and peace, knowing that we can do all things through Christ who strengthened us. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. amen. The order of the program this afternoon is printed in your bulletin. We will have one change. The laying on of hands will occur after the sanctuary choir has sung 12 gates to the city and Pastor Harshaw has delivered his exposition. Then will come the laying on of hands. Thank you.
Reverend Murphy will now speak to us on the occasion. Thank you, Reverend Wilkins, to Pastor Harshaw and fellow ministers, and to these wonderful deacons of Trinity Baptist Church, and to each of you, a pleasant good evening to you. At this time, we come together in what is the final activity of the 75th anniversary celebration. And I don't know about you, but after all the anticipation and the wonderful times that we've had, I kind of hate to see it end. But this really is not so much of an ending as it is a beginning. This whole celebration, this week plus long celebration, is a new beginning in Trinity Baptist Church. And truly, if you've been to the prior services, beginning on last Sunday, the wonderful sermons that we have heard and the singing that we have heard and all the things that have gone on, the beautiful banquet last night, we truly are starting our next 75 years in grand style. And we know that the Lord will continue to bless us because we will continue to trust in him. So happy to see those of you who are visiting with us today. We know that they are friends and family, and we are just so grateful that you are here today joining with us in this activity, the ordination dedication ceremony of the new deacons of Trinity Baptist Church. And so we will continue this afternoon in the spirit of newness, new deacons being ordained, new beginnings, and we are so happy that you are here with us. So let's be in a spirit of fellowship, a spirit of celebration, as well as a spirit of prayer for these new deacons and the new beginnings of Trinity Baptist Church. God bless you.
the office of deacon is one, as we heard in our scripture, that is ordained by the Holy Scriptures. But it is one uh, similar to being a minister of the gospel that is very difficult to study for. Because the duties of deacon or any official office of the church come from a strong relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and a call upon the individual's life. And in some sense, it is difficult to test that. But those deacons who are here today have uh, been in some intensive study with the pastor. And as is appropriate, we will examine them. The Bible says to study to show thyself approved. And I think concurrent with that, uh, there is the privilege of the congregation to test them to show themselves approved. And so we will have our uh, Grand Inquisitor, Reverend Ulysses McDonald, under the coordination of our pastor to examine the deacons at this time. I like that. Grand Inquisitor. <laughs> First of all, let me ask how many of you have already been ordained? Deacons that have already been ordained, let, me, let us see. Okay. So those of you who are being ordained today, may we see your hands. All right. Now, why don't we change places and let these men come over here and sit here so we're talking to them and so they will be talking to us. <laughs> it's not that we're taking your places away from you. It's just that we want these men right here with us so we can talk to them and they can talk back to us. If I had a microphone that I could carry with me, I would come right out here. But since I don't, I will stay over here. Now we're gonna make this brief and I do want to I do want to emphasize something. Um, the former pastor of the church and the pastor of the church and I were up in the study and we thought that it would be good to have an understanding that there is, there is a, a definite difference between a person serving as a deacon and as a person called into the ministry. A person that's called into the ministry is called by the Spirit of God and he must answer that Spirit of God and he is, and he is responsible to God for anything that he, he he, say, he, he, he says in the name of God, he is responsible to, to God for the, for the exposition of the scriptures. This is a man that is called to be a minister. <clears throat> there is one big difference, one other big difference that, that you may find in the New Testament and I will like I said, we'll be brief about this. Can you tell me the, the other difference between a minister and, and a deacon? How a deacon comes about, that is really what I'm after. Can you, any of you over here, tell me that? You folks, you, you be very quiet. Don't give them any hints. All right. Those of you who, here who are being ordained, can you tell me how 
a deacon comes to be a deacon. Absolutely. And you are basing that on, on what? The scripture speaks in Acts when uh, the uh, apostles needed help in uh, doing service. They said, look up among you and select seven men. Amen. His, an his answer essentially is this, that a deacon, a deacon is chosen from among the congregation and presented to the pastor. And after a period of time where he, when he, is, determined, he is determined whether or not this, this person qualifies for the deaconship, then he is approved by the church and by the pastor for to become a deacon. And he is basing that upon what is found in the, in the uh, sixth chapter of Acts when there was this slight controversy uh, in, the, in that early church about preaching and, and uh, uh, becoming a deacon. I hesitated there because I didn't want to give away my next question. What are the duties? No, let, let's back away from that for a moment. What does the term deacon mean to you? What does the term deacon mean to you? His answer is that a deacon, the, the, the term deacon means steward or servant. And that essentially is what the deacon is called to do, is to be a steward and to serve. Now, whom do you serve? The answer is, was, he served the congregation and the pastor. Let me give a little exposition here. Remember back in the Old Testament, and we can apply this to our time also. Remember back in the Old Testament, when Moses was holding up his hands so that the children could cross over. And as long as he held up those hands, see, the children could, could continue to cross over. Well, you try holding up those arms for any length of time, and they get tired, right? And you're going to start faltering. And you remember that Aaron and the priests came and helped Moses by assisting him holding up his arms, his hands, until that exodus was complete. Now to apply that to our times and to, to amplify on what you're saying, you're absolutely right that you, you serve the church and the pastor. You are that pastor's right hand. You are there to help hold up those hands so that he doesn't falter and give way. Okay. What are the qualifications of a good deacon?
was motivated by love with no selfish intent. He was to have no love for money. He also was not to be one who knows in the cities and hate. He was to be one who is black led, guided by the Holy Spirit. The foundation of the Word of God as his own, as his only reference for us. Stop right there before you eliminate everybody. <laughs> now you men over here, have you done those things? <laughs> Very well done. Thank you much. All right. Um, there's a couple of other things that I would like concerning the duties of deacon. And uh, let one of the others <laughs> find, find out. A couple of other things, very important. this he is to know the scriptures right he is to know the scriptures to be familiar with the scriptures and there is a duty that was left out with all of these things that brother Washington gave us There's one important thing left out and I would like someone to feel that one important thing. Serve communion. Okay, serve communion and follow through on that. There you go. To serve the Lord's Supper, which is communion, and to visit the sick. Important duties of the deacon should not be left out. Knowing the scripture being familiar with the scripture. Serving the Lord's Supper, communion, and visiting the sick. How am I doing? Okay. <laughs> All right. As I said, we're going to make this short. I think that you have answered the questions very well, and we thank you so much. God bless you, and from this point on, serve your office well. God bless you. Praise the Lord. I want to thank our inquisitor for those insightful questions. Choir will come for us now with a musical selection, after which the Reverend Eugene Marzette will give the charge to the deacons.
questions for tomorrow. There have been times when I didn't know right from wrong. All right. All right. But in every situation, my God gives me blessed consolation that my trials they come to only make me strong. of that song particularly apply to the deacons, to the ministers, and those of you who are just getting your feet wet, so to speak, as a deacon will learn that through it all, you will learn to trust in Jesus. And through it all, you'll learn to depend upon his word. And that's what Reverend McDonald was talking to you about in learning and knowing the scriptures. 
because his word will undergird you and his word will give you strength and his word will give you the wisdom that is called for in Acts 6 and 3. That wisdom that you will need and will give you the understanding. It will also give you the patience that many of your congregation and parishioners will push you to. You've heard it said, you know, I only had one nerve and they're getting on that one. Mm -hmm. But through it all, through it all, the Lord will see you through. Being a deacon is an awesome responsibility, is nothing that is to be taken lightly, even though we kid, and I'm glad that God did give us a sense of humor so that we can lighten things once in a while. And as we play through this life, and we have the various roles in life that God allows us to have and positions he allows us to serve in, that role of a deacon within the church, within his church, is an awesome responsibility. And I would challenge you to examine yourselves. Examine yourselves. Because as has already been said, the church was said in Acts and 6 to look out among you, among you and find brethren that were honest, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom and of good report. And only you and the Lord truly know how you fit those qualifications. So I would say and challenge you now that before the laying on of hands, that you would just take a moment and re-examine yourself and your commitment to the charge of being a deacon and what the Lord has called you through the church to do. Again, it is an awesome responsibility. Being a deacon is something that is larger than you are. Being a deacon is more than you are. But through the Lord, you can meet the challenge. You have named some duties. You, we've talked about serving communion. And we've talked about serving the sick. And those are something that a deacon does. But that is not all that a deacon is. It is more than the duties that you perform, but it is a lifestyle. It is something that is within the heart that builds as you depend upon God's word. It is something that becomes so much a part of you that you don't just walk into the sanctuary and become a deacon of Trinity Baptist Church. And then at that time you walk out you become somebody and something else. You are a deacon wherever you go, wherever you are. A deacon is something that you are and not something that you do. It's just like all of us who profess to be under the banner of Christ and call ourselves Christians. It is not something that we put on and then take off. You put it on and you carry it with you at all times, wherever you may be, you are a deacon of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who happens to be serving at the time at Trinity Baptist Church. Honest, full of the Holy Spirit, of good report. I would ask you if you would stand, please. Gentlemen, do you believe that the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments are the word of God and that they are the only rule of faith and practice of the church? And if you do, so state. Will you heed the scripture which says, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. If so, say I do. Do you promise to assist your pastor as a faithful helper 
and endeavor to preserve peace and harmony within the fellowship. If you so agree, say I do. Do each of you accept the office to which you have been elected and which you will soon be ordained? And do you promise the Lord being your helper faithfully to fulfill its duties? If so, say I do. And I would ask your fellow deacons, those of you who are already been ordained, if you would stand with them as well. And I would ask you fellow deacons, do you gladly receive these as your fellow officers, serving with you in their varied responsibilities, covenanting to work together as laborers with God? If so, please indicate your willingness by saying in unison, we do. And I would ask the congregation at this time, if you would stand also, Will you pledge your eager support to the work of God in this congregation under the leadership of these, your fellow members, who have been selected to serve? And will you renew your vows of fidelity by standing and engaging with me in a common covenant? If you will, would you say, we will? We will. Affirming our membership in the Holy Church throughout all the world and our fellowship in this congregation with those who have obtained a like precious faith, we renew our vows of fidelity to our Lord Jesus Christ and solemnly covenant and promise to work according to the leadings of the Holy Spirit. Except for our new deacons, you may all be seated. Deacons, we walk together in brotherly love as is becoming in members of a Christian church that we will not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We will endeavor to bring up such as may at any time be under our care in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and by a pure and holy example to win our kindred and acquaintances to the Holy Savior to holiness and to eternal life. Deacons, we regularly support the work of the church in all the ways that the Holy Spirit shall guide us. Having heard the duties of a deacon, having served with the pastor and being questioned and examined and taught by him and others, I charge you all to be true to your God, and therefore you cannot be untrue to yourself. May God bless you. you may be seated. Amen. I want to thank Reverend Marzette for that very fine and spirit-filled charge to our new deacons. As it has been said in scripture and by speakers before, deacons, you are the assistants and co-servers with the pastor, his support, his right hand to hold up his hands to stop him from being weary, to handle things that would take him away from prayer and ministry of the word. Trinity deacons, you are extremely fortunate to have, as a pastor, the Reverend Dr. Duma Alexander Harshaw, Jr. We have time in and time out come into uh, this sanctuary and heard people from all around the world speak high accolades of him because he is truly a man of the spirit. He is an intellectual giant. He is a humanitarian and a good man. He is a role model for all of us. If you will follow his instructions, and more importantly, follow his example of Christian living, you will fulfill the scripture that we read earlier.
us. The people, all of us, will prosper as a result of that. And your relationship with our pastor, Dr. Harshaw, is critical to that. We will be pleased to hear from our pastor, Harshaw, after the sanctuary choir renders the next selection, the next voice that we will all hear will be that of our pastor, your fellow worker, Dr. Duma Alexander Harshaw, Jr.
Amen. Praise the Lord. Where can we go but to the Lord? Praise God. I want to thank Reverend Robert Wilkins for those very kind words of introduction. Appreciate those thoughts and the intent of those thoughts. Thank God for uh, for him and for all of the associate ministers who are present and I certainly praise the Lord for these deacons uh, who have been and are giving their life in service uh, for the Lord and the life of this church. And, uh, I certainly have appreciated the time of, of fellowship and uh, these weeks that we have spent together, praying together and sharing together at very intimate and deep levels. And appreciate the examples that you have represented in the life of the church, uh, not just during this time, but for many years, many of you. And, and I have been enriched by uh, your ministry in the life of Trinity and been challenged by your faith and uh, I thank God for you. And I thank God for the kind of bond that we share together as brothers in Christ and that is the greatest thing that we can be even above a pastor and deacon is brothers in the Lord. And I appreciate uh, that regard and appreciate what your lives uh, have represented as we think about that and think that through in terms of what it means. We certainly want to thank the family members, wives, and the support persons for these deacons. And we know those of us who spend so many hours in this church that without our wives, without our families supporting us, it's very difficult to carry on in an effective way in leadership in the life of the church. And we know that many times it's trying the hours that we're called upon to serve in this church, hours away from you and hours that you have to give up in terms of our presence and our support in the home in order to get the work of the Lord done. And we know how crucial not only are these deacons' families, but particularly their spouses in terms of what they do in the life of the church. And we say thank you to the wives who have loaned us your husbands. <laughs> and allow them to, to be free uh, to serve God because we know that when there's a fight at home and there's constant uh, conflict uh, that, that diminishes the effectiveness of the ministry. And so I know that we're all growing in grace and, uh, and God is with us in the midst of what that represents. But your presence here today and, and your support means an awful lot uh, to these deacons. And so thank you so much. And we recognize you and honor you as well. I would like to take this uh, moment as we uh, briefly reflect upon uh, this time to direct our attention once again to that sixth chapter of Acts, which appears to be the foundation for what we do today, and we know that it is considered the classic uh, passage of scripture in defining the role, the origins of uh, the ministry of a deacon in the life of the New Testament church. And so I, I turn to that as we lift up in that passage a particular individual, and I would like uh, for just a few moments to reflect upon the life of Stephen. And as we think about uh, the miracle of service, uh, Stephen, a man after God's own heart, the miracle of service. And we find here in the sixth chapter, the passage has already been read, and I won't I'll read it again, but we'll lift up a certain aspects of that passage in order to, uh, to lead us to where we are headed in terms of our moments of meditation on the role and the calling of the service in the life of the church through the role of a deacon. And we see in that sixth chapter of Acts, there in the second verse, first of all, the phrase is, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Uh, wherefore, brethren, look ye among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And there's one sentence in that fifth verse that describes the subject of our meditation this evening. Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. In verse six, a sentence that 
uh, says they laid their hands on them. In verse 7, and the word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of priests were obedient to the faith and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of the word. We bow with me as you pray with me and for me. Dear eternal God, our heavenly Father, we rejoice that we are able to gather once again in the house of prayer in order to worship the living Christ. And that while we have come together as part of our 75th anniversary, we're coming as uh, servants of thine in order to worship and in order to give praise, in order to set these lives aside, apart, that they might give honor to you in the life of this church. And we thank you, Lord, that in every aspect of our worship, you are present and you seek to be present in a part of. And may we sense your presence in a special way in this service as we pray for these men and their lives and their families. And as we pray for their ministry, as we pray for their dedication and rededication to the work that you have called them. And Heavenly Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would minister to all of us present here in this hour and simply touch our hearts as you call all of us to a deeper commitment. And it's not just for these deacons, but for all of us as a people of God to, to give an answer, as it were, the reason of the hope that is within us. And, to be willing to give what you have given to us back again that you might be lifted up in the midst of the world. Have your way, O oh Lord, and make our minds and our spirits obedient and help us as we move from this place to where you would have us to be. These and all blessings we ask in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for your prayers. and. I just for a moment like to look at this passage once again as we try to understand what, what God was doing in the early church and particularly in the life of one individual, Stephen, as this passage indicates and, and see him as an example not only for deacons but for all of us as Christians as, as we seek to obey God and we seek to respond to the call of God upon our lives. And first of all, we understand that, that these deacons were called into being because of the needs that were within the congregation of the early church. And, and that first verse uh, tells us that there were divisions among the people and that perhaps there was some sense of racism as well and there was uh, some classism that was existing even in the early church right after Jesus had gone on back to heaven. And, these people had gathered together in order to carry on his work in the midst of the world, that already there were divisions, that there was this sense of who uh, you were and what origin you were. And, and right there, they, they noticed that maybe everybody was not being treated right. And, and because of the tremendous burden that these uh, preachers had, these pastors had, in terms of leading the flock into a better understanding of service for Christ, uh, they were not able to answer all of these uh, problems and to solve all of the problems and, and yet uh, because of the problems and because of the importance of the problems, the, the role of the deacon was called into being and so we see that, uh, that it is important, these issues that are raised on the side as it were, as people simply are worshiping. And we see here that uh, these men then were called forth. Um, and they were called forth in order to serve and to be uh, of service to the Lord in the midst of this early church in order to uh, bring them together in unity, in order to see that everybody uh, was treated justly and, and righteously. And, and, and so they prayed and as a result of that prayer, as a result of seeking God, they found these men, these seven men who were willing to give their lives in order to service. And, and we see how important it is that, that these particular issues are dealt with in the life of the church, that, that as people come together and worship, they have more than just spiritual needs. And, 
And sometimes we think that people just have spiritual needs and as long as they shout and hear a song and listen to a sermon and then go home that, that somehow that's all that they really need. And yet, yet this helps us to recognize that ministry in the life of the church is much deeper than that. And, and these people had, they needed to be fed. They, they needed clothing. They needed counsel. They needed jobs. They needed health care. They, uh, they needed someone to care for them in the midst of their daily life. And, and all of that was part of the ministry that, that God was calling the church to in this early day. And how important that is indeed to understand as deacons that your role is so very vital. And we see here that, that the disciples and those disciples who were leading the church and who you might call the preachers and the pastors recognized that the word of God was so important that not anything should, uh, should come in between the word of God and the congregation and that above all things uh, that that word needed to go forth and while at the same time those other needs had to be addressed. And so both are vitally important and it's vital to the body that both of these are met. And, and their role specifically was to preach the gospel and that was their role in the life of the church. And so they say it doesn't make much sense for us to, to leave the word of God and to serve tables. Not because serving tables was something lower and something that was less important, but it simply recognized that there was this order in what God was doing and that, and that everybody had a role as it were and that these needs must be met. It didn't say, well, let's forget about serving tables and let's forget about all this and let's just have the people to come and hear the gospel and that's all that they need. It didn't say that. But instead, let God raise up those individuals in the life of the church who would be able to meet those needs so that the word of God would come forth and so that there would be power to that word that people would see that not only are they hearing the word of God, but they are being fed at the same time and they are being nurtured and loved and cared for it in the midst of their lives. And so God is moving in such a powerful and a marvelous way. And indeed, God blessed that church because of that. They could have simply pushed those people away and said, well, if you can't understand what is going on and work together and deal with your problems and stop murmuring, well, then you're just going to have to get out of the church and go and find your own church. They didn't say that. They, but but they, they embraced all of those divisions, as it were. They embraced those people, but they provided for their needs to be addressed. And there's only so much that one individual can do, and there's no way that the pastor can do everything in the church. There's no way that the ministers can do everything. There, there's no way that the leaders in the life of the church can answer every need, that there must be that element in the church, as it were, that, that kind of condition in the church where, where people minister to one another, and that people see that God is active in the midst of the church to use those who are willing to surrender their lives and to give their lives up for Christ. And so indeed these disciples were then called forth and able to do that. And so they looked out among them. It didn't say look out and find the best educated. Look out and find those who talk the most. Don't look out and find those who dress the nicest or have the biggest bank account. But it said look out among you. Uh, men of honest character and report and men who are full of the Holy Ghost and full of wisdom. You can get folks that are full of a whole lot of things in the church, but this church was counting on people who, was, who were full of the Holy Ghost, full of the wisdom of God, and then appoint them for this service, for this business, this vital, this important business of ser serving human need. And so that God raised up these seven individuals. And as a result of that, then, the disciples were able to give themselves to the ministry of the word. And they prayed and they did all they could to separate themselves because the burden that they were under was such a heavy burden to proclaim the gospel and to see that people heard about Jesus Christ and understood what the Savior was all about and what the Savior was doing in the midst of the world and, and that not anything should interrupt that and, and they were under that burden to preach and to teach and to tell the nation as it were that Jesus was a risen Savior. What a powerful and important ministry of the word. And you note in verse 4 that, that that ministry of the word goes out in its effectiveness only as it is related to the continual prayer. And so that they were to pray all day long and then be able to stand up and preach the gospel. 
It didn't say that we might give ourselves to the study, though I'm sure they studied in their own way and did whatever they could. But it didn't say that we would then uh, separate ourselves to sit back and serve, save our energy so that we could stand up and preach, but that we would pray that we would first of all be in touch with God to hear the voice of God in order to know what to say to the people. And so that they were able to pray because of the deacons, because of their role in the life of the church. And there was one deacon there that was a unique deacon. A deacon there who has served as an example for every Christian, every one of us. And the beauty of, of Stephen is the fact that he was not a preacher. That's is what makes his story so profound. If he were a preacher, you simply would understand that and say, well, that's what preachers do. You see, a preacher is the one who works miracles. It's a preacher who ministers to people. It's a preacher who is full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost. But Stephen was not a preacher. He was a deacon. He was just someone who was called from out of the congregation and was able to be used by God in the midst of that. And so he was simply a servant of the Lord like we all are. You see, we expect preachers to be different, as it were, in terms of their Christianity. And so that's why we put so much on the preachers, say, well, let's not do anything because the preachers, the pastors are supposed to do everything. But you see, Stephen represents the fact that God will use anyone whose heart is open to his move and who is willing to surrender to God and say yes to the Lord. He was full of faith. He was full of the Holy Ghost. And as a result of that, God used him in a mighty way. He was not a preacher, and thank God he was the preacher. Because we can see that God can use anybody in any way that they will allow. And so the deacon indeed can be full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost. And used by God in a mighty way. We see that Stephen was part of that group of individuals who was willing to say yes to the Lord. And as a result of that, the church was solidified in terms of its ministry in that day and time. And there's no way that the church can be strong here unless the deacons take their role of leadership in the life of the church. Unless you take that role that has been spiritually provided by the Lord himself. You see, man didn't put this together. The Lord helped them to recognize and realize that those leaders of the church could not do it all. That they needed deacons, that, that, that the whole brunt of the ministry was not upon them but they needed someone else to be there and so God set that up and he made the church strong as a result of those individuals who were serving in the life of the church and Trinity will be only as strong as the leadership in the church and that's not just the pastor but that's the leadership in the church and that's the deacons the deacons who have said yes to the Lord and who have been willing to allow God to to shake their lives up as it were in order to create a new man a new husband, a new father, so that God might have his way in the life of the church. And so that you stand like Stephen stood as role models. You say, well, I'm not a preacher, and so I don't have to be like the preacher, but, but you don't see any distinction of that here in the life of Stephen. He didn't say, well, I don't have to be holy because the pastor's supposed to be holy, but I'm just a deacon. You see, it's all right if I drink wine. The preacher's not supposed to drink wine, but it's all right because I'm just a deacon. But that life was just as sacred as the life of Peter, as the life of all of those disciples in the midst of that church. They were just the same before God. And so they were all just as holy and sanctified as God wanted them to be. And so that they were all on the same level. And again, that's the miracle, as it were, of Stephen, as we understand that he was simply one of those individuals who sat in the pew, as it were, and that these men and these women looked upon that congregation and say, hey, how about brother so-and-so? And 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 God said, yeah. There's something about their character. There's something about their love for me. There's something about my spirit in their life. And everybody said, yeah, those are the men. And so that affirmation came not only from the pastor, but it came from the congregation as well and to say to them that indeed we are calling you because God has placed his hand upon you, because God has been so active in your life, indeed, that we can see that the Lord is your Lord and the Lord has used you in a mighty way in order to give strength to this congregation. And that indeed is what 
God wishes for you to do. You come at such a time as this where we have talked about new beginnings in the life of the church. And here God is calling you forth. Isn't that interesting? For such a time as this. Isn't that interesting? For a time when the pastor needs bonding and you have been called together to be part of that bonding. For such a time as this. And new beginnings will not take place unless we hear the voice of God in the midst of what God is seeking to do in the life of the church. And it's going to be more than one individual. You see, this is a teamwork and one person can't win a football game. But it takes the whole team. If the whole team is not doing their part, one person cannot get across that goal line. There won't be any touchdowns if there's just a quarterback. There won't be any touchdowns if it's just a halfback. But it takes everybody doing their part in order to see that that touchdown is acquired. And, and that's the same thing as we understand what God has called us here to do, that, that there will be no victory unless there's victory for all of us. If there's not a team in this church that is working together and praying together and loving together, there will not be a victory. There'll be no more touchdowns. But as we are willing to allow God to work in our lives, then we know that the Lord indeed will, will work in the life of the church. And that sickness that we heard preached about at the 1030 service is a sickness that affects all of us. We're all part of that sickness. And, and, if, and if the cancer is in the leadership, if the cancer is in your relationship with me and mine with you, then we know that there won't nothing better, if you excuse my English, happen in the life of the church if there's cancer in our relationship. And how can we expect the people to be in it? If you hate me, how can we expect the people to be any different? If I hate you, how can we expect the people to be any different? But if we love together and we are bound in Christian love, well then that just kind of works its way out among the people in the midst of the congregation. And God is glorified by that. God is honored by that. And that's kind of what happened in the life of Stephen. That Stephen, we don't read anything about him getting caught up in trying to be a preacher, getting caught up in trying to lead the church. That wasn't his concern. He didn't get caught up in trying to see if he was greater than Peter or if God had called him to be the pastor of the church. All he did was gave witness to the Lord and serve Christ. And in, and in the miracle of that serving, we see that God blessed that in a mighty way. We see that they had recognized and affirmed their leadership and so they called them together and they laid their hands upon them like we're going to do today because they believed that there was something very important in that spiritual, symbolic exercise of the laying on of hands. In other words, to say that, that God indeed is blessing you, that God is setting your life aside, that you are in line, as it were, with leadership in the life of the church, that Christ himself started by calling his disciples into leadership in the church. And so their lives were affirmed and set aside. And there's nothing greater than the affirmation that has taken place in your life today that somebody else is saying, you're a good man. It's all right if you believe it in yourself, and some of you believe, and you know you're good men. But it means so much more when your wife says, you're a good man. <laughs> when your family says, you're a good man. And then when the church says, you're a good man. It means so much that people are watching you, that people believe in you. They have confidence in your faith. They have confidence in what God is doing in your life. And with that comes a very rich responsibility. Because when you leave this church, as you have times in the past, but when you leave after today, everywhere you go, you take Trinity Baptist Church. Remember that. Everywhere we go, we take Trinity. And the same holiness that comes down and the same feeling of the Holy Spirit that comes down when we're here in suits and in worship and praising God is the same holiness that ought to come down when you sit at your dinner table. The same holiness that needs to come down when you work on your job. The same sanctity that takes place in your neighborhood because you were there. And Trinity is in your neighborhood. It's on your job. It's in your classroom. It's in your home. And so that God is using you in a mighty way. You represent so much. We represent so much. And that's what Stephen represented. And I don't know of any better representative for what God was doing in that early church than Stephen. Because you see, after he was set aside for service and, and after he allowed the pastor to do his job, and he just did his job of serving and waiting on tables, the Holy Spirit got a hold of his life and God began to speak through him. And the Bible says that the word of God increased and the number of disciples multiplied. 
And great miracles were done in that day because a man like Stephen decided to be an instrument of the Lord. And you see, he was full, not of his wisdom. He was full, not of his plan. He was full, not with his agenda, what he wanted to do, but he was full of the Holy Spirit of God. And so God was speaking in his life in a mighty and a marvelous way. And so that the disciples were just growing in number because the Holy Spirit was residing, that everything was being taken care of. People who needed service when they came to the church were being serviced. Somebody was hungry when they came together in worship. Somebody needed a job. Somebody needed a hug. Somebody needed direction. Somebody needed counsel. And while, and while the, the proclamation was going forth, people's needs were being met because those deacons were there. And they were loving God and loving people. And that's what you see reflected in verse 1. That's loving humankind. The people were arguing and fighting among each other. And so God raised up men who could go there and be peacemakers. They didn't go there and start trouble. They didn't go there and start separating groups and taking folk off into their own homes and meeting with them and deciding on things. They didn't take people off somewhere in a coffee shop and tear the church apart. But they began to go in among that crowd and were peacemakers. And they brought the people together and said, don't say that, sweetheart. Don't do that. That's not what the church is all about. And they were able to bring that group of disciples together in such a way that their needs were met. And so the word of God multiplied. That people's lives were being blessed. You see, that church would not have grown like it did if they had stayed at verse 1 and started cussing each other out and destroying one another and backbiting and getting on the telephone and writing letters and standing in people's face and accusing one another and putting people out of the church and looking down the rows and find out who's given what and who ought to be in the church and who should not be in the church. They didn't do that. They just started loving folk. They just started being peacemakers and bringing them together. Everything else is just like the world. If we just start dividing and going into our separate groups and in our little cliques, that's just like the world. But we're called to be the people of God. <laughs> and so as a result of whatever happened between verse 1 and verse 8 and verse 7 and verse 6, the whole church turned upside down. And that problem went away. And so that you have the great responsibility of, of addressing problems in the life of the church in such a way that those problems are solved and the problems go away. And the fact that God indeed is moving in you and among you in order to bring solutions to the problems that exist in the church. And so if you thought that you were called to this role and that there wouldn't be any problems and that you would just sail through and dress with your nice suit and stand up on Sunday morning and extend a hand to somebody who was coming down, but then you were wrong. If you thought that that's all it meant to be a deacon was to show up on Sunday morning, particularly first Sunday, and do your job and then go home and kick back and watch the game and that was it, you were wrong. There's more to it than that. You'll find yourself here at night. You'll find yourself here when there's no crowd to applaud you. When there's nobody looking at you in your beautiful suit and your nice shining shoes. It'll just be you doing the work of the Lord. You'll be knocking on doors and dogs barking at you and people mistreating you sometimes just in order to take communion, just in order to visit someone who's sick. You'll be traveling all over town sometimes, going to a hospital perhaps and find out that that person has been transferred after you've spent all your gas and your time and going. And then you have to come right back again and do it tomorrow or do it next week. You'll find yourself sitting with someone and you would have sacrificed something at home. Maybe you have just left a warm dinner and you ran out doing the job of a deacon. And you go and pray with a sister or a brother. And you grab their hand and you pray with them and say, I'm here in the name of the Lord. And they'll look up and say to you, thank you for coming, deacon. But I want the pastor to pray for me. And you'll say, after all that time I left that hot meal... <laughs> wasted my gas <laughs> and you have the nerve to say that to me then you got to go back and do it again you got to keep facing the same people who you disagree with sometime in committee meeting the great plan of the church is coming forth and you've got to vote and you're divided on that vote in the deacons meeting 
and you begin to discuss it and maybe it gets awful heated in that meeting and yet you've got to come back and see that same brother next Sunday. You've got to come back and look me in the face after you disagree with the decision that I made and look me in the face again and know that I'm a brother in the Lord. You've got to keep coming back. You say, well, well, do I have to keep doing it? What about you, Pastor? I've got to do the same thing. <laughs> They were bound in this together, as it were. And so the calling is a calling of a lifestyle and the calling of commitment beyond our comprehension. It's more than just dressing up on Sunday, and I know you know that. It's more than your name being called. It's more than being on the role of a deacon, but it's service in the name of Christ. It's building this church. It's maintaining the presence of Christ in this church. It's reaching out a hand in love and seeing that people's needs are met. And so when someone comes after the service is over and maybe even after a long day like we've had today and someone comes down that aisle, you can hardly walk and they come and say, I, I, I just came for help. And so often they end up talking to me and I'm trying to find somebody to, to help. And it means sometimes saying, okay, here we go after we've been in service all this long time. Now I've got to come and pray with this individual. I've got to give them $5. I've got to find a place for them to stay. I have to feed them. And that's all part of what it means to be in service for the Lord. And so you see the miracles that, that are spoken of here finally in, in verse 8 are, are the miracles that, that come out of this, this life of commitment. It's the miracles that come as a result of the Holy Spirit, yes, but, 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 but more than that, the greatest anointing is, is that love and that service that then addresses human needs in such a way that God can simply rest upon that people. And that's what happened in that early church. It wasn't just that God was doing miracles. He wanted to do miracles, but, but he needed a vessel to work through. He needed a deacon. He needed a deaconess. He, he needed a choir member. He needed a preacher. He needed an usher. He needed somebody who was willing to say, yes, Lord in order to rest upon, to fill up, to use, in order to speak to human need. And that's the miracle. It's the miracle of service. It, it's a miracle of those folk dealing with all of the problems in that early church, the murmuring and all of the complaining and all of the divisions, and in the midst of that, showing the love of Christ. That's the miracle of it all. The Holy Spirit comes out of that kind of love. And it's not just the great miracles of healing the sick and all of that, the foundation out of which all of that comes is the love of Christ. And sometimes we yearn for the great miracles and we want God to use us as we lay hands on folk and see things happen. And we wonder why we don't have those gifts. I know one thing, they, they come out of a foundation of service and love. And so you find folk who've just been there every week every day, every Sunday, year after year after year, trusting God until that breakthrough comes and all of a sudden, out of that foundation, God begins to move and then people's needs are met. And that's exactly what we are called to do. And so your lives are sanctified by the calling of Christ upon them. You are made holy by the righteous blood of Jesus and you are filled with the spirit that comes from God and that spirit will do miracles among us. We'll handle every dispute. We'll heal the sick, raise the dead, open blind eyes. And in the same way that Stephen served the church and ultimately gave his life, in the same way we can serve in the life of the church because Stephen was full of faith and he was full of power. And that power came out of his willingness to be a servant of Christ. And that's all being a deacon is. We close with that thought and know that the disciples wondered who would be on the right side of Jesus and who would be on the left side. And, and they were simply in their carnality and they were doing the best they could at the time. They wondered who would be the folk around Jesus when his kingdom came. He said, well, you know, if you're going to be with me, it's, it's not going to come out of anything but complete service and the giving up of your life. And as you give your life, well, then you will find your spot and everything will be all right with you. And you won't have to even ask that question because all will be well. And so those who serve are those who are lifted up. Those who give their life are those who indeed receive life again. And not only life, but life on top of life. And Jesus said, I've come that they might have life 
and have it more abundantly. So this is a new venture in your life in a different kind of a way. You've served as deacons, most of you, for some time, and yet this is something different. This is a special day, <laughs> a special time. And my prayers are with you, and I know indeed God will bless you. And I thank God for you. God bless you. This morning when Pastor Harshaw prayed, he alluded to the, his grandfather. <clears throat> I would like this time like to mention my grandfather who I tried to pattern myself after as a deacon. I saw him in this role for many years and he also served on the board of deacons at this church. Just a brief poem and then I will read the names of the deacons who are deceased. May I say to you that I tried to not miss any of the deacons who I had known. If there's someone that I have missed, I would appreciate it if you would call it to my attention and we can add it to this list. But be it known that even though their names are not called, we do remember each one of them, those who have passed. This poem, I don't know the author. No one hears the door that opened when they passed beyond our call. Soft as the dropping of petals of a rose, one by one our loved ones fall. But the memory of each loved one like the fragrance of the rose, God sends to linger with us till our own life door shall close. This is the list of deceased deacons. Thomas Alexander, Samuel Ayers, Lee Bass, Philip Brown, Prentice Brown, B.T. Clarkson, Jack Bryant, and my own grandfather, Eugene Barnes, J.M. Coulter, Thomas Crawford, David Davis, George Edwards, <coughs> Benny Foster, Sherman Fuller, a. E. Granville, Hayward Grogan, Luther Harris, Isidore Henry, Claude Jolly, Alton King, Joseph Means, Roy Mubin, James Middleton, Benny Mosby, James Powell, T.A. Satchel, Sam Shields, Willard Small, Gus Smith, Louis Starr, Addison Terry, Lawrence Thomas, <coughs> Wilfred Thompson, Willie Turner, Philip Varner, Arthur Vaux, G.W. Watkins, Clarence Wurford, John Woods. So ends the reading of deceased deacons. And may I add that I knew each one of these men and I have served with each one. May I at this time solicit your prayers for each of us as deacons, Paul Cassell, our eldest, and I thank Duray Pittman, our youngest. Keep us in your prayers is our prayer. Thank you. I want to take this time to give a certificate to those deacons who finished uh, my deacons class as well as uh, those who have met other requirements um, and who are here ordained uh, this afternoon and would like to read those names off and ask uh, again that they would uh, 
uh, come and uh, just stand in a line uh, in front of us so we can see them. You maybe have been seeing the back of them, and now you need to see their faces. <laughs> and so um, they're, in, they're not in order. Joseph Westbrooks, Ishman McCray, uh, John Williams, Alexander Warthen, Edward Turner, John Tixera, Eugene Tate, Duray Pittman, Lloyd Lowton, Carlton Herring, last but not least, I haven't forgotten about you, Marco, <laughs> Marco Carlton. 